Although my sports passion is now running, throughout my childhood, it was soccer or football, as the English correctly call it. In fact, I played competitive league soccer all the way up to the COVID period, um, by which time I was over 60 years old. People would often suggest that I shouldn't be doing that at my age and that I should give up. My response was, if you stop, well, that's it. You're never going to do something that you love ever again for the rest of your life. You have to take that a bit seriously. You need to think carefully before you do something like that. But what if you didn't have a choice? What if you were forced to stop by an accident and people told you you could never do your sport again? What would you do? Well, that was exactly the situation facing Hillary Allen in 2017. Hi, and welcome to the Running Book Reviews podcast, where we review books written for runners, about runners, and by runners to help you decide if you would like to read the book for yourself. We also hope that listening to us chat about running can help keep you motivated about your own running or maybe inspire you to try something new. My name is Alan, and with my co-host Liz, we're going to talk with author Hilary Allen about her book, Out and Back, A Runner's Story of Survival Against All Odds. Out and Back, A Runner's Story of Survival Against All Odds is about Hilary Allen's miraculous survival and recovery after she fell off a ridge in Tromsø, Norway during the 2017 Tromsø Sky Race 57K. Hillary's survival and recovery was not only due to her perseverance and desire to live, but also because she had the right help at exactly the right time. During the race, there was another competitor, Manu, that was tracking Hillary less than 10 seconds behind her, and he saw the fall. He immediately scrambled down to Hillary's broken body and realized she was still alive. Manu was trained in mountain rescue. I mean, what are the odds of that? And he took immediate action to try and stop the bleeding while other people who also witnessed the fall called the race organization. Miraculously, Hillary survived, but it was a long road to recovery and she had to learn to accept help along the way. Difficult for somebody that has always been proud of her independence. So a little bit about Hillary Allen. Hillary Allen grew up in Fort Collins, Colorado to an outdoorsy and scientific family who have supported her in all her pursuits. She has earned a master's degree in neuroscience, physiology, and structural biology at the University of Colorado in Denver. Hillary started out very passionate about tennis until it led to an eating disorder. Soon after discover- uh, soon after recovering from her eating disorder, she discovered trail running, and this solidified her recovery because she quickly realized that she needed to eat to perform. Hillary also teaches part-time while running professionally, Um, or at least she did, and was also a a North Face athlete until 2022 when she joined Brooks. So we're very happy that you could be with us today. Welcome, Hillary. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. (laughs) Did we get your bio bio right? No, the great bio reading. I know I've done a lot. There's a lot of moving parts and changing. Yes, to answer your question, I, I still teach, I still sub, but now I'm more, um, I'm a running coach. So I get to use like the physiology and like the neuroscience in that realm. So it's pretty fun. That's Fantastic. Cool. I think you've also done some like public speaking. Like I, but we saw a Ted talk mm-hmm. at one point on YouTube. We could link that in the show notes, actually. So I didn't even yeah. mention a Ted talk. <laughs> so oh, you've done so many too. things. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I guess the first question that uh, we usually ask is, um, uh, you know, like I think a lot of people, they, they've, they you know, they've heard of your book um, and of course your story about the accident and they probably all are like, well, obviously this kind of story has to be a book, but what made you decide to write a book about this? And when did you know that you'd be doing that? Yeah, so... I mean, honestly, it's, it's tough, right? Because writing a book, um, especially one that's as personal and I, and I chose to be very vulnerable and honest in this book. Um, it's scary to put those thoughts out and stories out into the world. You know, I mean, it's like, it's one thing to write it. And then like, I had this like moment of once I published it and it was like out there and like people were reading it that I was like, oh no, like they're going to know all this, <laughs> these things about me. Like, it's kind of scary. 
but I think, you know, that's just kind of putting that aside and like pride or ego or whatever that is. What made me want to write this book and the story um, was because I was having a lot of trouble in my recovery. I didn't really have anyone to guide me in that journey. Um, most athletes in particular professional ones, if they're injured, it's kind of something you don't talk about. You kind of disappear and then you show your face again once you're crushing and like ready to do it again, or you don't, you just like require, like retire and then you're forgotten about, right. It can be very sad. And I didn't really have this, this guidance, but I was also having these conflicting emotions of feeling very thankful that I had survived this accident but also very sad about, you know, not knowing if I'd run again, not knowing what my future held, not knowing if I would be able to return to something that I truly loved, let alone compete at a, you know, competitive professional level, which I had been doing. And you mentioned my background of neuroscience is that have always appreciated the power of, um, like therapy, like talking things out. And for me, um, I'm very introverted. So I like to write things down. Like it's a way for me to slow down my thoughts and put them down to paper. And so journaling has always been something that I've, you know, relied on since I was, you know, in college or even like in, you know, junior high. Um, And so I kept on writing about this process and I started this blog early on in my recovery and I got so much support from it that I, that I, I wanted to kind of provide a voice to my experience in the community. um, And yeah, I think I officially put pen to paper and like put it out and like, you know, signed a contract with Blue Star Press um, in 18 months after my initial accident. Um, And this is actually when I um, did that, started writing that TED talk. And ironically, it was right when I had broken my ankle, like another injury related to this accident. And I honestly, you know, I, I honestly needed a reminder that I could kind of do this thing um, again. And yeah, it was kind of something that saved me, helped me to recover again. And, um, it was a really cathartic process. So, so lots of people sort of go, okay, I'm going to write a book, you know, I'm I'm doing this and I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to write a book about this, Mm -hmm. but you actually didn't, you actually wrote, it seems from what you're saying and thinking about your journaling, you actually wrote all the stuff and then later you went okay I'm gonna make this into a book and it's probably that bit that was difficult for you Mm -hmm. it was it was like that I think that was the hardest part is like you know having all the stories there was a bunch of things obviously that I didn't include knowing what to include and um another part that was really important to me was me writing it myself like I wanted to have I wanted to own the copyright I wanted I didn't want to have a ghostwriter and admittedly it might have you know limited you know, I'm not a professional writer, I, but it was mm. very important for me to write my own story. Um, and of course I had an editor and they would help me kind of like, you know, reframe things and rewrite things and in what to include and not to include. But that was the hardest part for me is like, how do I arrange this story? Cause yeah. I, if you read my, you read my book, it's not chronological. It's kind of, I've, I decided to like structure it based on themes that I was having a hard time within my recovery. And I would kind of like go back to present moment, like stories of when I was running and then like reflect back on moments when I was injured. And I kind of arranged it based on these mantras and these themes that I was dealing with throughout my recovery. Yeah. I think that meant, that meant for pretty good reading also. A couple of points there. You say, Oh, I'm not an author. Okay. So uh, I can actually rewind a little bit to a previous podcast that I did where I mentioned your book. Um, and I'll bring it up again now because it's more appropriate because we're talking about your book. <laughs> um, I will defy anybody who's listening to the podcast to pick up the book, go to chapter one and read the first one and a half pages. And then you will have to read the whole book uh, <laughs> because because the first one and a half pages of the first chapter, I think there's a, there's a pre-word or something, which forget mm-hmm. that, jump to the first chapter, read the first page and a half. If you read that, you will have to read Hillary's book. And yeah. so if you wrote that yourself, uh, Hillary, yes, I don't did. play down your author skills. That's one of <laughs> the most you. magnificent pieces of writing that I've read in a running book. Oh, I mean, we thank talk you about so pieces much. of literature, but 
I was, I, I guess I'm a geek runner. And I, tra- I like running <laughs> trails, um, but it, it was absolutely gripping. Um, it was. It must be. Uh, nobody knows what I'm talking about here, except except us probably. But it's basically the description of you falling off the cliff. Mm-hmm. Of this, like this moment that basically changed my life, right? And and I think you know my book is about this accident recovery and this story. And, you know, my, my experience through it, like, I think many runners have a hard time when they're injured and they're separated from something they love, but I chose to start the book there because I feel like the bigger story of my book is it's almost like an invitation, um, to those that read it, if they're going through a hard time, whether it is running related injury or just a big life change that they have the strength within themselves to get through hard moments and, Like there are these life defining moments. I think that everyone has where you can define literally my life was different after a certain point. And this was that defining moment for me. Yeah, I guess uh, this would be a good time to ask you about maybe another defining moment was um, so you your first passion was tennis like you you seemed like from your book, it just seemed like you love tennis as much as like you love running now. I think that's what it sounds like. Um, but you stopped playing tennis and you moved to running. So I guess like, what was the defining moment for you when you decided like, well, maybe tennis is not for me, or maybe it was more of a process. And then how did you get into ultra running? Because like ultra running, I mean, now it seems like it's almost a household word. It's like you ran a marathon. Now we're going to go run an ultra, but like, like this was maybe 2000, like more like 2000. Well, yeah, like 2010, 2011 is like I think when I switched to running. So still like pretty early on and like, you know, when ultra running wasn't super at its prime or as it is now. So, you know, I was, I mean, yeah, I I played tennis. It was something I really loved. It was kind of a, I've always been an athlete, but I like stumbled upon tennis because it was this perfect balance of like an individual sport, but also a team sport and like a mix of like sprints and endurance and I had this incredible record in college that every time we, I went to a third set, so split sets that I won it because I just had this like knack. I would just like outlast my opponents. <laughs> um, and the, honestly, I mean, tennis was great. It had some pretty hard moments in it um, as far as like the community and kind of what, you know, I had done dealt with personally. Um, but it wasn't, it when, when I went to graduate school, um, I was time crunched. I mean, graduate school requires a lot of, um, a lot of time, but then also like, you're not paid that well. (laughs) And so I was like time crunched and like money crunched. And, Mm -hmm. you know, tennis is actually, even though I love the sport, it is totally not me. It is like a country club sport. Like I'm a girl that shows up in like cut off shorts and like a tank top and like, you know, I'm not wearing these like Tiffany's necklaces that I was like literally playing against these girls in college and in high school. Like, I just felt like I didn't fit in, but I was there because I was tenacious. I was like gritty and I could like get it done. And, um, it wasn't until graduate school that I, like, I was still playing pretty competitively, like post collegiately, but I just couldn't afford the time to travel to like where, um, you know, I was working in Denver and then like, I'd have to travel to Denver to, pl- to Boulder to play like club tennis and it just costs a lot of money. And so I always used running in my free time for, um, staying in shape. And that was kind of when I made that transition is like, I still wanted to exercise and to like, have that kind of breath of fresh air for my body and mind. Um, I mean, I, I know many of us, like you're both are runners, like the, the running high is a real thing. It's like, it, there's it the zero chemistry behind it. It mimics like the scanning of like your eyes up, down, side to side mimics REM sleep, rapid eye motion. That's what it is. So there is something very, very rhythmic and, you know, like almost hypnotizing, but just like, just Zen, like you feel like relaxed, this clarity from it. And so I wanted that in my life still. And so that's when I started running because, and I found this running club that was, that met really close to, to my house in grad school where I was living. Um, they met at five 30 in the morning. So I could, you know, do that <laughs> before I'd have to go into lab. And ironically, these women, um, they were fif- like in their early fifties. Um, they were Olympic trial marathoners in the eighties, so had run for Reebok, had been running together wow. for 20 plus years. And they welcomed me into their club. 
And one of them, Janie Day, um, she's now Janie Day Lucor. She held the record on the Pikes Peak Ascent, the Mount Washington Ascent. Um, she was just, just like this weapon um, on, on trails. And uh, she kind of trained me for my first marathon in 2011, I believe, or 2012. And um, from there, like introduced me to trail running. And after I ran like, you know, two marathons and I found out that really wasn't where my heart felt the most alive. Um, every Sunday was a recovery run on the trails and that quickly became my favorite thing. And I started meeting more and more people. And then this like world, this like word ultra kept on being thrown around. I'm like, what is this? <laughs> and then, uh, I literally discovered ultra running by accident. And I had like a knack for running uphill and running far distances. And I just, it just kind of stuck. It sounds like you met a wolf pack. So you were raised by wolves. <laughs> totally. I know. <laughs> maybe that could be, that could be the title of book number two. Yeah, maybe. I know. I'd like to write a second book. <laughs> yeah. Flipping the whole thing on its head. I mean, you became a, a, a incredibly successful uh, ultra athlete and then had this crushing injury with your fall and mm -hmm you know, a question mark about whether you would, I mean, I think people told, if I remember the book rightly, some people actually told you that you wouldn't run it. You wouldn't run again, you know, yeah. like walking would be a good ambition for you. That, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, Which is a terrible thing to say to runners, but doctors don't know any better. <laughs> they didn't know who they were dealing with. But yeah. the, 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 the thing I wanted to ask you was, you know, you get to a point where, you know, you describe the feelings and all, all of that stuff, which, which we identify strongly with, and then you get, you get, have all this taken away from you and, and just all you have is a big question mark. Did you, how did you feel around that? Because I always say running is kind of almost everything about my psyche. So if I couldn't run, what, what's, who would I be? You know, yeah. um, did you feel like that? I mean, yeah, 100%. And I think I, I felt that way for a lot longer than I wanted to a lot longer than I was ready to experience that. Um, <clears throat> I just felt so lost, you know, I felt like something was just like ripped away from me and taken from me and I didn't know who I was without it. And I think that's scary because I do think that running is an important part of each and every one of us. If we're runners, like it's something that we're going to be forever but it also takes different forms, you know, as we age, if we get injured, um, if we're, you know, experiencing a busy, busy part of life. And what happened to me is that I was able to almost embrace, um, myself as a more complete athlete, like not just a runner. I mean, like the irony of it all is I started out as a tennis player and like, you know, playing ball sports and all these other things. I mean, I haven't ever just been a runner and, just because I was doing it professionally, I didn't need to have it occupy every single piece of me. And so through the recovery, I was able to kind of find other sports that I really liked because I think movement is just a part of me. I'm always going to be, and now I say an athlete, not just a runner, but an athlete. And that's, you know, skiing, riding my bike, you know, getting in the gym, playing tennis still, or, you know, other, you know, other activities. I'm always going to be an athlete. And, um, sure. Running can be my favorite modality, <laughs> but it can, you know, take different forms. Um, and like with the whole thing about, you know, some, and they, they did this doctor who operated on my foot, which was a very significant injury. Um, she described it as a foot changing injury. You know, it's a Liz Franck injury, something that like football players get and like hardly any of them she, who she had operated on had returned back to elite level sports. So she wasn't just like, you know, talking out of thin air, mm -hmm. she wasn't making up these things. She was being truthful with me. And yeah. I do appreciate mm -hmm. her honesty. Um, and I think like, you know, doctors are like given statistics and with the statistics of like the, let alone the elite population that she had operated on and the rest of the United States, like, uh, you know, she wasn't lying to me. She was trying mm -hmm. to like talk straight to me. Um, but at that moment, it's like, I took it all in. I was so scared. I still chose to have the surgery, but I also like knew it was up to me to decide if I could run again. And if I even wanted to try, and I wasn't sure I wanted to try for a long time, but the more strength I gained and like, I kind of made a, a pact with myself is like, I didn't want to compare myself to my past self. 
um, I just wanted to get back to like moving and doing something that I loved because something that made me feel most alive is to be outside and in nature. And I wanted to get back to that. Um, and the kind of icing on the cake was that I was still able to run and kind of return to running at a pretty high level. You talk about the past and your past self as a runner. And um, you actually mentioned in your book that at one point you felt kind of a lot of pressure when you became a professional athlete and you didn't really realize it, but you realized it like after the accident. Right. Um, if you could go back in time, is there any advice you'd give yourself or like something you would have said to yourself back then before the accident? Yeah, you know, it's hard to 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 do that, but I think if I was like talking to a past self, right, like it'd be nice to not have to experience this like life threatening thing to like learn all these lessons. <laughs> but, I know, is isn't it always like that? It's like I know. you gotta you have to go through the hard experiences, and then you're like, you know, I really appreciate this now, but like, why couldn't I have just appreciated it without yeah. this other thing that happened? Exactly. I think for for me, it's like appreciate all things that make me a full person. You know, I think if I ignore those things, like I've been a scientist longer than I've been a runner. I played different sports before I was a runner. And now that just because I was at this like, you know, place where I was a sponsored runner, I didn't have to just give up every single aspect of myself to pursue this one thing because that has never made me happy. Um, and I think it's, you know, like feeding those other parts of me that make me a full human. It's like, I can, I, like, I work well with like, you know, metaphors or like comparisons. Like if you're a tree, like you don't just water one part of the tree so that the one branch is like super nice and the rest of it is dead. Like, you know, that's not a full tree, you know, and I need the, I think that's the the best thing is like to have all these different branches and like interests and avenues that are all like watered not necessarily equally all the time, but, you know, at different times they, like, they're tended to, um, and taken care of. And so, um, that's what I would say. And then also, I don't know, I just like redefining what strength is. This is something that I learned, like strength isn't necessarily how fast you can run a mile or how fast for, in my case, you can like (laughs) run uphill, you know, strength isn't sometimes strength is sometimes in like giving yourself a break and, you know, taking a step back and, um, asking for help when you need it. Um, these like kind of non-traditional definitions. Yeah. That's what I would say. Um, so I guess, I guess like, because, you know, you did mention, uh, being a scientist longer than a runner. So you, you actually, uh, because you came from, a from a family that also has science backgrounds. And yes. um, you mentioned your dad and uh, not because he put any pressure on you, but like you mentioned in your book that you sort of like wanted to please your dad and get a PhD in neuroscience to like follow mm-hmm. in his footsteps. Um, but not because he had put any pressure on you. It's just something that seemed like you wanted to do on your own. And during yeah. your journey, your dad actually sent you um, an article about how dedicating a whole life to a single thing would be sad because we need to know ourselves and pursue the things that might deviate from the path because those experiences enrich our life. And I, like, I just, I love that message, but do you think that kind of without that permission, it's almost like he gave you permission. Like, do you think without that you would have just been on a straight path to getting this PhD and maybe, maybe not, you know, gone to run professionally or like some of the other things that you ended up doing later? Yeah. I mean, I remember that moment because I was super scared to tell my parents that like I was going to pursue this running thing. And like, cause I wanted to get a PhD ever since I was a little girl. And, um, just cause my dad did it. My mom's also a scientist. And like, I, I was, I was scared to kind of admit it, but then I remember my dad, like saying, this is that, that Chinese proverb and kind of using that tree as an analogy that I just spoke about is like, that can be your biggest failure. It's like, and there's actually um, a book that I've been reading. It's called Range um, by David Epstein, I believe. Um, uh, what is that? Are you saying that uh, to me? No. Oh. Uh, let, so, so the running joke is, so sometimes we have authors on, well, I guess this is one of those days. And like, I'm always like the least educated of the whole gang. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I have a because PhD in pharmaceutical Alan, science. Exactly. So, um, and Liz, Liz so... actually had a, has a master's. So if we oh, were, if we were no, the Big no. Bang Theory, she would be the I've... Wallowitz of the uh, people. I don't even have a master's. I have a bachelor and a half. Like, Oh, there we go. Uh... <laughs> 
Yeah, I have a nursing degree, which you don't need a bachelor's for. And then I have an engineering degree, which I did a bachelor's in. So nice. Yeah. Yeah, those are so lost. I'm, those are I'm, I'm I'm still definitely. Every time like, we get a guest on who has PhD, <laughs> I, I kind of rub it in on them. Yeah, it's just so my now, nature. Now Alan's just making, you know, he's just he's just rubbing it in, but you know, on on the screen. <laughs> yeah, but no, the, this this book that I've read is like Range, um, by or Reading by David Epstein about like how generalists triumph in a, in a specialized world, and it's like talking about how if you can be good at many different things, like you don't need to specialize. Like there's like, and they talk about it in reference to sports. They use like, in the opening chapter, they use like Roger Federer and Tiger Woods as an example of like, Tiger Woods started when he was super young, like was born with a golf club in his hand. (laughs) Roger Federer like had like more of a sampling period before he was actually like really good at tennis and like spent more time and put in the hours and like they show some of the data. And I think this can be, um, applicable to anything in life, right? Like you don't need to specialize Mm. super early. And this is what I've learned too, is like, I mean, in my, in, in running, um, and this is like what my dad was encouraging me to do is explore their avenues. Like sure. Science is great, but then also like have this opportunity and explore it and see what it can teach you and, and what you can, you know, learn from it. And, you know, when it's run its course, you'll know, and then you can kind of go back to these other things or, you know, go down a completely different avenue from something that like sparked your interest. Um, And I think it's even holds true for me now. I've learned, learned this through running is like, I'm not just a runner. I use other sports to supplement my running and I feel like I'm stronger for it. Yeah. um, I tell a story um, with respect to my children. The two of the girls, my girls got very, very interested and very good at at ice skating. Mm. They took it up when we came to Canada and (laughs) My wife and I were actually a little bit frightened that they would become super excellent, you know, like a a bit scared. And the reason we were scared was because it just takes up so much of their lives and Mm -hmm. they were so young. And Mm -hmm. we were actually thinking, yes, it's going to be fantastic experience for them and we'd probably have to support them. But at the same time, it's going to subtract so many things, Mm -hmm. which might be their potential futures. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah so I get exactly what you're talking about and especially like children too I think this is a really important message is like things need to be fun and I even think like not even just children for adults too that is something why I love trail running so much is because it is fun I generally genuinely love just getting outside and being on the trails that's why I kind of decided to go away from road running because I didn't find as as fun um (laughs) No offense to what you're trying to accomplish. <laughs> not that, <laughs> not that road running. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> One of the things we say about our three three hour marathon training is that the the actual training process, the process itself, the 18 week program or whatever, has to be fun. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Because then you get the joy of the process. You may get the cherry on the cake at the end. You <laughs> might not, but then you've at least you've got a whole cake. Yeah, exactly. Mm. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. <laughs> this is not our show. This is your show, Hillary. So um, <laughs> let me let me turn back to the book. Um, let, let me go back to that that sort of fateful day and your fall. Um, mm-hmm. When you think back on it, was there anything that could have tipped you off with respect to the ridge? Was it mm-hmm. like, do you go, well, now that I think about it, I should have approach that differently or I should have realized or or was it just yeah. really just one of those like impossible to to predict things you know I do think it's the latter I do think it was one of those impossible to predict things but it didn't mean that I didn't spend like you know countless nights like thinking about what did I do wrong and it wasn't until two years later when I went back to that same spot and like talked to Manu, the guy who kind of was the first on the scene and, mm-hmm. and scrambled down to rescue me that I kind of like understood that it wasn't my fault at all. It was just something that had happened. And I can't like, I'm not a risk. I'm not a risky person. Um, I like, I'm very calculated. I think the only way to mitigate risk and it is risky, like just living and like going particularly outdoors in the mountains, it's risky. But the only way to lower that risk, um, and it never will reach zero, it can only just approach it, um, is to be skillful. And I practice running on that type of terrain 
all the time. I mean, I was quite comfortable with it. It was something that I wasn't like scared of or like hesitant or like reckless, certainly not. Um, and it was just one of those things. It was just kind of like, and again, it was different from any other fall that I've had where you have that realization where like almost like a split second where you realize you're tripping and you're like, oh crap, I'm going to like catch myself. That didn't even happen. It was just so instantaneous that it just felt like the rug was like pulled out from underneath me. And like one minute I was running and the next I was just airborne. And so um, from people that I spoke to mono in particular, like that they, there was like, I think it was just a rock that had given way underneath my foot. Um, and like kind of catapulted me off of this place where there was no like recovering from it. And you were the first one through, I think, right. If I read that. No, was I wasn't another... actually like the race had been running. So there's plenty of people ahead of me, but I think like at that point, it's like, you know, people run and maybe on that rock had like moved it a little bit. And then, you know, you step on it and then, or you step on a slightly different one where rocks have moved. Like Norway is, is a train where it's notoriously wet. Um, you know, things move and it wasn't wet that day, but of course there had been rain. Um, and it, you know, so yeah, that's like the best I can explain what happened. And during and during your recovery, you 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 became um, an intimate friend of the gym, which uh, yes, I think beforehand was kind of the antithesis of what you wanted to do. You know, get out yeah. in the get out in the wilds and the outside and the outdoors and nature. Mm -hmm. And now suddenly you're a beginner uh, gym rat, and gym is going to probably be your whole <laughs> life in terms yeah. of your your exercising for a while. Did you learn to love the gym or did you learn to hate the gym? There was definitely a period of time where I completely hated it. And it took like every ounce of me to like go there because for instance, for instance, like I felt like I couldn't hide. I was just out in the open. Like people could come and talk to me if I wanted to. And like, I didn't really feel like talking. Like I was going through this just like hard moment. Um, and I like to go outside. Like there's something that just wasn't the same as going in the gym but I tried to lean into it because I saw it as just like a way to get back to what I loved um, and like a tool to get there. And so I just, I tried to embrace it the best I could, even though it was just like took so long because for many of these injuries, I couldn't drive. So I had to like, not only arrange a ride to get there, but like I was on crutches or a scooter and like, you know, moving things around the gym, it just like took extra time. So it was just like, yeah, it was just um, I felt like life was moving in slow motion. And I, I hated it for a while, but I felt like that was just extra energy that I was wasting instead of, you know, em embracing it. And what about now? Do you, do you say that like now, do you like, have you learned to like the gym or it's still kind of like, well, I do it so that I can do the other stuff I like. I think it's a bit of both. I do genuinely like it and I enjoy it and I enjoy the community and the physical therapist that I have there. Um, but certainly I do see it as a way to help me stay injury free and like outside and all these good things. So the physical part of the recovery was incredible enough. And the journey concerning that was um, riveting in the book and uh, exhausting to read. <laughs> um, but you actually say in the book that, that in fact, that was the minor part, the, the major, almost the bigger part of it was the mental mm -hmm. part of of dealing with it and and then coming back. I mean, you just said earlier that you weren't sure whether you had the desire to come back. Um, yeah. So tell us about your therapist. Did you get sort of help, psychological help or mental toughness help? Yeah. So, um, I mean, I've, I've been, I've thought like had the, I've known the importance of therapy from like for a long time. Um, especially if it's just like things in neuroscience, it's like, they always click if you pair it with um, talk therapy. And so, um, yeah, the mental side was just awful because I was just feeling so lost. And I was, I felt like I was trying to hold on. I didn't even know if I wanted to return back to the sport that I was just like so scared, but then also just scared of like, I've, I've always been like a perfectionist and I wanted to like be my best. And I didn't know if I could do that. I felt like I had lost so much time and how could I ever return back to who I was. I was like constantly caught in this, you know, comparing act. And so being able to talk that out and kind of voice my like deepest, darkest secrets and um, concerns and fears, it was really helpful for me. 
And I think the magic happened is where I kind of let that all go and just decided like, okay, well, no one else gets to define me. Like, like even myself, like I have been very adamant about (laughs) not using the word comeback because I feel like it's, it's just doesn't fit. It's like, I'm from the moment this accident happened, I am a different person. I am not the same as I was before, nor will I ever be. And that there's some sadness to that, but it's reality. And why like waste energy lamenting it when I could put that energy towards creating something new and different and beautiful and perhaps better than before. And that's kind of the shift that helped me to kind of keep pursuing, you know, something that I loved, regardless if I could get back to this previous version uh, of myself. I guess that was probably a rocky road with respect to to that, especially I I know I I had a rocky road in the reading of it when I thought, okay, here she comes, (laughs) just fought her way through. And then what was it? 18 18 months later, you break your ankle. Yeah. I was so sad. Yeah. And then it happened again. I broke my foot. Um, actually right when I published this book, <laughs> Oh no. Uh, um, I, had I, to have I was only, uh, I was yeah. only reading the book and I, I was giving up at that <laughs> point. I was like, no, that's it. I give up. I'm, Believe I'm, me, I'm checking I, out. I wanted to. And like, that's like kind of, I needed that reminder. It's funny. It's like, I needed that reminder. Um, yeah, I mean, it's so hard. This is like one of the hardest things because recovery isn't linear and even like training isn't linear. You know, it's like, It'd be nice to, if it would just, you know, if I could, you know, didn't have to learn things the hard way, but apparently I do. Um, and yeah, I wish it, you know, sometimes I, I wished it didn't happen, but every time I was trying to see like, um, what I could learn from those setbacks and like the opportunities that it gave me, um, even when it was impossibly hard. Do you think any of this, like, because now you mentioned that you're coaching. So do you think mm-hmm. any of this helps you in, in being a better coach? Oh yeah. One, oh, 100%. It helps. It's like with not only like being able to relate to someone who's going through an injury, but also like, you know, the feelings, the emotions, but also like, okay, like you're not just going to lose all everything. Like it'll come back faster than you think. And like having to guide, guide them through those moments has definitely helped me. And to kind of pick up on like, okay, like this is maybe something we should pay attention to. Um, yeah, it's definitely helped me become a better athlete, but also a better coach. I think the, uh, the, the, the troubles you went through seem to, in the book, seem to make you into a bit of a, a mantra guru. <laughs> yes. Um, I, I wonder if maybe your book number three, because we've already given you the title for your book number two, your book number <laughs> three could be Hillary's Mantras or... Yeah. Maybe Man- yeah, Mantras like with Hilly like, Goats or... Mantras. That's a good one. I like that. <laughs> um. Do you have any particular mantras that you sort of hold to that you the, that you're fond of that that you feel have helped you that you that you're able to share with us? I'm putting you on the spot a bit, but no, it's okay. I mean, um, I think they're constantly evolving and changing, but one that's like definitely stuck with me since very the early days of my recovery was believe that your best athletic days are ahead of you. And it might seem like naive especially in a sport where it's like, you're going to reach a time when you're not PRing anymore, uh, you know, making a, or like making a personal best, but is that a reason to give up and like throw in the towel and not being an athlete anymore? I think not because you can still pursue your best at the present moment that you're in. And that's something I hope to do my entire life. And another mantra is like, and it, maybe I, 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 th- I think it is a mantra to, I treat it as one is like, um, I want to be the best version of myself. And that's like something I wake up every day and like, I'm just excited to try my best, whether if it's at like, you know, the training that day, then like the, the things I have on the docket. Um, but that's something I love about running is that it's an opportunity to try to be the best version of myself and kind of get that, get those like, you know, last eeks of things out of me. And sometimes that also means like being the best version of myself is taking a rest day (laughs) that day. Um, But yeah, those things, but like during a race, I think a a good mantra um, is like staying curious because that's just me at my essence. Like I'm a scientist and I always question and I'm always wondering and curious about the physical world and um, staying curious about my like physical body and like where my mind will go in these like dark places. But then 
yeah, just like to keep observing and uh, pushing through the hard moments. I guess, um, you know, there's, there's something about, um, writing a book. Like I, I was listening to, um, the experience that, you know, Kara Goucher had mm -hmm. when she was writing her own book that's only coming out like soon, I think in, in March or April, but she mm -hmm. was actually talking about the book writing process. And she said it was really difficult for her because it was like, she had to relive, a whole bunch of hard things multiple times to write the book. Um, mm -hmm. Do you feel like that's how it was for you? For me, that's always been cathartic. It's almost like a way of like kind of talk therapy and like talking through it. And it's, it's kind of a pact that I made with myself early on is that like, I knew how important it was for me to talk through these things because if I didn't, I think it would manifest as something like darker or um, I don't know what it would manifest as. Um, it was just important for me to get them out in an honest way. And that was writing for me, um, which didn't mean it was like easy. Like it was one of the hardest things. Like I wrote about it in the book of going back to Trumso um, and back to that, like that site where I fell, like talking with um, Manu. And there's a point where I literally wanted to get on a plane. I was like, I made the biggest mistake of my life. Like, why did I come here? Like, this is awful. But I stuck with it um, and I wrote about it and it was one of the most beautiful experiences I think I've ever, I've ever had in my life. And one of the most meaningful ones, it just goes, with just my overall belief. I think that hard things are worth doing. And I think that the harder they are, probably the more, more worthwhile they are to do. And just because they're challenging doesn't mean it's a reason to give up or to not pursue them. That's a good, um, <laughs> that's a good message to live by for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I think runners, we, we tend to like to punish ourselves and do hard things like to just yeah. to start with. So, um, <laughs> but your level of hard was much, much bigger than, you know, but it, it means it's easier said than done. And it's not like this whole, and I don't, don't want that to be confused with like, Oh, like suffer through it, like gut it out. Mm -hmm. Like there is a time when you should stop, but like, you know, it's like kind of the uh, right amount of challenge, like not to the point where you're killing yourself when you're just like, you know, de depressed and just like lost, but like, you know, there's, there's a point where it's too much, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like having manageable goals and running. Like you, yes. you have to, you do have to have like a long-term vision and maybe like some dream goals, but from the day to day, you need the goals that are sort of challenging, but achievable because otherwise you'll just get discouraged and yeah, exactly. For sure, it's pretty clear that you're an incredibly strong individual, physically and mentally. Uh, but you did mention that, uh, you know, even you, you have some issues and it comes out in the book with eating disorders and self-image, mm -hmm. certainly, in, certainly in the past. Um, do you think this is still a, a problem ongoing? Are we getting better? Are we winning or are we losing? Right. And, you know, I think it's like a continual process, right? I mean, I, I would say that I'm recovered from that, but it's not that, you know, being in the realm of professional sport and also in, you know, this, I like, in, you know, this social media lens where I think like your value as an athlete can almost be, you know, compared to what you look like and your outward image and, you know, your last best result. And that can kind of go down this rabbit hole of, oh my gosh, am I like doing enough? Like comparison and all, all of those things. So I think the difference is instead of like, I'm aware of it, I'm aware that that's there and that that's like, you know, it can be, I don't like to use this word very much, but like triggering, it can be like something that could, that I'm just aware of that's like uncomfortable for me. Um, but I think that awareness is what allows there to be a little bit of space. So recognizing it, like being able to have a moment of being like, huh, I don't like that. And then shifting, you know, my actions and not, and choosing not to go down a path that would be like reactive or like something that I had done in the past. And I was kind of in a, not as healthy of a mindset. Um, it doesn't make it any less difficult. Um, and some, you know, days or weeks are hard, especially if you didn't have like the best result and, you know, you're comparing yourself, but um, I think overall it helps me to like solidify my perspective. Um, and that's like a perspective. There's certain things that I won't, that I refuse, like absolutely refuse to sacrifice, um, for running. And I, and my health is one of them. And I know what it's like to be in an unhealthy space physically and, and especially mentally. 
Um, and I just refuse to go back there. So if it requires me to eliminate certain circles or um, not follow certain people or even be a, a, around certain groups, I am more than willing to do that for self-preservation. And um, I think it's just a, a knowing of self and being stubborn in that. And that is also something I think runners, especially ultra runners have in spades, uh, stubbornness. <laughs> yes. I know my parents have told me that many times. So <laughs> yeah, my parents used to tell me that too. So yeah, I guess we got that in common. <laughs> yeah. I noticed at the end of chapter 10, you made references to ending relationships that weren't really taking exactly. you where you needed to be in your life. Is that what you're referring to? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And I think it's, it's very hard to do, mm -hmm. um, but it can be necessary. And it's also, it's also cathartic and very freeing. I think the ultimate freedom is freedom of choice. And, you know, with that, like it's, it doesn't mean that it can be, it's always the easiest choice. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Especially when it's relationships. Mm -hmm. you know, those are, yeah. Those are never easy to. But you are who you surround yourself. I think it's like to be around a team and someone who truly believes in you and your goals and builds you up is like, that is something that this whole recovery process, like that power of community, this is something I really found and was able to lean into. And I realized that it, it's importance and it's power. And mm -hmm. it encouraged me to be, to be that for other people in my community as well. And um, I don't think I really truly understood that until I experienced it firsthand. Yeah, I think um, like in kind of the same vein, like I've kind of learned that um, with respect to just like positivity, you know, y if you surround yourself with positive people, then like it's a bit like you get it by osmosis a little bit like they mm -hmm. it just it's contagious. But the same is true of people that are negative, like if you're always with people that uh, that, you know, see the the dark side of everything or are very cynical um yeah you end up feeling a little bit like that yourself so yeah, yeah definitely definitely i believe in this is this is heavily into relationships at the moment because she got married at the weekend <laughs> nice that's, congratulations that's <laughs> yeah thanks it was uh yeah we we uh we decided to we just decided to elope. We just went to the courthouse and oh, that's awesome! Yeah, I would say that's how if I ever get married, that's how I would do it. Or you know, a required five mile hike to the top of a mountain somewhere. Oh <laughs> yeah, you know, you know what? Like both of those things, they're very low stress because you don't have to worry about like who sits beside who at the reception because yeah. there's no reception. <laughs> like, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> it's fantastic. Um, so I guess because you're um you're running up to your um your deadline so um, <laughs> maybe we can just uh ask you where is the best place for people to get a copy of your book if um if they want to yeah thank you so much and I, and I hope they do um well I have my website hillaryallen.com everything like to follow me and um and also like I said I have a still blog and like a newsletter and um like links to Amazon is probably the easiest place to get my book. <laughs> um, and then also there, um, I did an audiobook recording so you can kind of get, uh, get the book there as well. Um, that was a really special process to be able to kind of record my own, my own story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think great. that's great you're, that you you're, have you're that actually option. talking through the uh, audiobook yourself. Yeah, uh, yeah, that... I I do the whole thing. I I like I narrate my own audiobook, which is it was mm. actually really fun to do. Yeah, I don't I don't normally do audiobooks, but that might be something worth uh, trying to, <laughs> trying to listen to. Just don't run with it uh, on the trail for the first chapter. Okay? Yeah, probably not <laughs> okay. a good idea. <laughs> Can I ask you a silly uh, a silly yeah. a personal question? Yeah. Um, do you have a middle name that begins with F? I do. This is so funny. I know why you're asking this. Okay. It's probably in relation to my email. Yes, it so is. My email is H F, F Allen. Allen. I'm not going to say the whole thing because this is recorded, but anyways, yes. <laughs> but if you read it, it says H fallen. Exactly. And so like after by accident, people are just like, oh my aunt Hillary, you're really embracing this. Yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> Literally, I can, I can, my dad is a, love him dearly. He is, he is a very serious British man. And he said, okay, like, if you're going to do an email, he's like, you're going to do HF Allen. Cause he's like, his, his name is Kenneth Jeffrey Dennison Allen. All right. So my, my middle name is Faye. 
So he wanted HF, like to like, this is you, right? Like, this is your name. But like, then the irony of it all is like, I fell off this cliff and now my email <laughs> reads H fallen. I'm like, oh exactly. my God. Yeah, maybe it was, maybe he was predicting it. I'm just okay, kidding. Okay, <laughs> I'll, 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 I'm obviously not the first person uh, to notice. In, in, yeah. in your circle to notice. <laughs> I've noticed it too. And I just laugh. <laughs> I see from your website that you have this huge um, running calendar, very full running calendar prepared for 2023. Yeah, I do. It's going to be, I think the theme for this year is like the recovery between big races, because at least for the running calendar, I have um, Canyon's hundred miler in April, followed by Lavaredo in um, June and then UTMB. And before UTMB, I'm going to be doing a stage race out on the East coast, um, ragged 75, uh, before I kind of head over there. And then of course I love gravel biking. So I'm like doing some gravel cycling events, but I basically use these as like the long, long training efforts. <laughs> so oh, yeah, it looks like a big, big, uh, plate of, um, of activities. Yes, it is. I'm a Sounds amazing. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, if if I could also just comment for people who can't see us on video because we just do audio podcasts, for somebody who's been through the troubles that you that you went through and the recovery that you went through in Out and Back, your book, you're one of the most positive, up, smiling, sunny people that we've ever had on the podcast. I think, Hillary. Oh, thank you so much. I, uh, and it's not fake. It's definitely genuine. Like I said, I think, um, you know, running and sport can keep you young and being curious can also keep you young and happy. And, uh, that's really why I do this, um, is because I want to keep that optimism and don't get me wrong. I mean, I am a scientist. I can be a realist and I can, I joke with my friends that like, I usually piss people off because I'm a little bit too honest, <laughs> but uh, at least we can laugh about it. So, <laughs> well, that's great. Well, um, what we normally do is we we'll, we'll do, we do is Liz and I do a little summary of our sort of thoughts and and, and comments on on the book. But we can do that after um, after we let you go. Yeah, sure. So we'll ju we'll just say goodbye. Thanks for uh, thanks for spending the time you spent with us. We really appreciate it. And I wish you every success in 2023 in the running calendar. I shall be watching you with interest. Yes, yeah. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to speak with you both. So should I should I give my uh, just overview on the book first? Sure. Well, first of all, the uh, the descriptions of the races that Hillary gives as she races them are fantastic. So if you're a runner and you like to sort of live the race, the descriptions that she gives uh, and you know, the insights of a runner while they're racing at a, at a high level while they're doing it um, makes for good reading. So just that on its own is is, is fantastic. Um, Hillary made reference a, a few times to a chap called Manu, who was the first person to reach her when she had her fall, which was, you know, the whole reason for the comeback and the book to begin with and at the end of the book she goes to see him and she goes, they go back to the to where she fell and he at the start of the book she describes how she fell which is completely riveting but at the end of the book he describes what he saw so watching her fall and then going and finding her sort of body almost at the end um so i think that's kind of puts the bookends on the book and it makes a great closure to the to the intro, which is her falling in the intro. So the the book overall is a great read. It's exciting, um, but it's also very inspirational. And I think there are many lessons that we can all learn from the book without having to fall off a cliff. So um, I guess a little bit in the same vein, I uh, the story is it's, harrowing and heartbreaking and if you're a runner you can just imagine being told uh that you'll never run again and the heartbreak that hillary felt at that moment and then when hillary got re-injured i was so sad for all the hope that she had lost in that moment after working so hard to get back to running over 17 months uh, the book was engaging and then there are a lot of other side stories about the people that help Hillary during her recovery and comeback, like her coach who um, she called from Italy before she uh, uh, 
before what was her warm up race. So she went to Italy for a warm up race before going back to Tromsø. And I don't even know if I'm saying that correctly. Uh, but it was 3 a.m. in the U.S. when when she called him and he answered the phone. And so you know it was people like that that um, uh, that you know just just helped her get through all of this. Before each chapter, there is what looks like a black and white watercolor picture of some landscape, mostly with a mountain in it. Um, I thought that was a really nice touch just to the, the physical layout of the book. And uh, I also like the overall look of the book, the purple and white and black cover. Uh, the size is nice. It's kind of like a pocket size book. Uh, if you have really large cargo pockets, obviously, like not uh, women's clothing pockets and uh, the cover picture was uh, is Hillary and like a runner on the ridge of a mountain so it's it's really a nice uh, it's really well done yeah so another one to recommend to everybody definitely thank you for listening to another episode of running book reviews a big thank you to the publisher blue star press for providing review copies of the book and a huge thank you to Hillary for spending time with us today. If you'd like to leave us feedback of how we can improve the podcast or you want to suggest a book that you'd like us to review in a future episode, please leave us a comment on any of our social media platforms. We are running book reviews on Facebook and Instagram. And on Twitter, we are reviews underscore running. Please also follow us on social media to find out about new episodes when they're released or just subscribe to the podcast on your favorite streaming platform. If you've been listening to us for a while and are wondering how you can help us out, there are a few ways. If you enjoy the podcast, spread the word. Tell your friends about us, share a link. Um, share a link to your favorite episode with a running partner of your choice. Or you can leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Or you can rate us on Spotify out of five stars. All of that helps us and we appreciate it. Also, we're now on Buy Me A Coffee. Uh, where you can go to our Buy Me A Coffee page. Just go to the site of Buy Me A Coffee and look for Running Book Reviews. Uh, you'll find a page there. You can buy us a coffee if you want, or you can just go there and uh, free of charge, you can access uh, various um, little snippets and photos and stories and uh, a little bit of extra audio about other things. Bye for now. Bye.